you may be, over land or sea. <laughs> this is good. We heard this morning, uh, it's interesting, uh, you guys, we heard this morning that we had some people from, uh, from Ireland watching, um, I believe an evangelist from, from Ireland, and also uh, some Kosovo people. And that was really good because on the video slide this morning, do you remember seeing the, uh, the events of the year? It had uh, Lift Kosovo and it had the Kosovo congregation of their church and all that. So uh, maybe that would be a good encouragement for them to see that. And then, uh, um, let's see, just all over the place. Germany was one place. And I'm thinking, good night, man. Who in the world, you know? You just don't think about things going like that. Uh, that's kind of like that cosmic kind of stuff for me, uh, but it was uh, really good. And so we praise the Lord, and for all you guys that uh, are watching with us now, I know we've missed the last couple of weeks. We had the hurricane one week, and then we had what should have been the hurricane the next week. We had flood and all of that. You remember that? Good night, man. That day, we probably got twice as much or three times as much water on that week as we did the week of the hurricane. Know, did. It was, we I know it. Yeah. <laughs> it was so amazing. I know it. It was funny because Chris, I know a lot of you guys don't, I mean, you know Chris and you see him uh, uh, and he runs our sound and all that, but he's really very, very funny person, a very comical person, uh, kind of a dry wit and, and subtle in a lot of his humor. <laughs> but he, we sent, I think Tanya sent a, like a text about uh, praying for people and hope you didn't have much damage and so forth the, her, at the hurricane. And he sent a picture, he sent a picture back of a little video back of him <laughs> cleaning, up, cleaning up some flower petals <laughs> out of his yard and said, yeah, I had, a, I had a real big cleanup job here or something like that. And it was just a few flower petals and he was clean. <laughs> he said, yeah, I had a lot to clean up in my yard. And I thought, yeah, I praise the Lord. Man, that's, that's funny. Yeah, he's, he's funny like that. But uh, anyway, we're back. We're back. So <laughs> we're going to try to, just so you guys would get an idea of what we're trying to, oh, how about them dogs? Amen. I, was telling, I was telling our Georgia constituency, and uh, I was just bragging on those bulldogs. Boy, they're tough. Yeah, I've got on my shirt today, and uh, I'm representing. But, uh, but anyway, those, those Georgia dogs are bad. Uh, but anyway, the, yeah, ain't no. Ain't no, waiting for the tide. By the way, I don't know if you guys are sports fans or any of you guys watching are sports fans, but um, yesterday it was so funny. There was a, they were showing a scene from, I think it was uh, uh, Iowa State. Iowa State beat, who did they beat? They beat somebody they shouldn't have beat yesterday. Um, and they, they're having a good year. And I can't remember who it was. Who, who was that? Oh, TCU. TCU was fourth in the nation. Texas Christian University, fourth in the nation, and Iowa State beat them. And Iowa State's having a good year. And so, anyway, there was a sign in the stands that said, we want Bama. <laughs> I said, that is so funny, you know. I mean, people are so comical about stuff like that, you know. Starting, right now, we want Bama. <laughs> I said, oh, you better be careful what you pray for. <laughs> yeah, you better be careful what you pray for. <laughs> but anyway, it's, uh, it's good to have good rivalry and, you know, just, just that kind of stuff. And it's uh, that's a good-natured uh, thing about that. But a lot of people are very serious about, about, their, about their stuff with their ball team, I can guarantee you. But it's good and, and fun. I enjoy college football a lot. It's really enjoyable. Do what, Bree? Yeah. <laughs> oh no! A little cartoon drawn up of that. Yeah, they did set them on fire. I tell you, they warmed them pretty good yesterday. But anyway, enough about football. I know. I know everybody. You know, stick to the issues. Probably there's somebody on the on the web saying, "Hey, would you get to the point?" And uh, you know, probably. But but that's just that's that's life. And um, what I what I wanted to do is go just run just scam back through what we've done in the first five of these lessons about money, 
You know, we're in a series, just to remind you guys, and I know every one of you did your homework and you did everything, so I don't have to really remind you. You're caught up and you know, remember everything about all that. But um, we're, on a, we're in a series of basically the five major areas of, of life that we have as Christians and what the Bible has to say about these five areas of, of our life. When you come to the Lord, there are certain responsibilities that, that you inherit from him. Um, we know the purpose of God is to recreate us in the image of Jesus and it, as an overall big, broad purpose uh, that we would be conformed to the image of his son is what Romans 8, 28, and 29 really say to us. And so in order to do that, um, events start happening in our lives, trials start happening in our lives, tests. Uh, of course, temptation comes in, and we have to wrestle with that and put on the whole armor of God. And, you know, there are a lot of instructions in the Scripture about how our life begins to grow and move. But the Bible has a great deal to say about these five areas of life, my, my mind and that my mind can be transformed and that, that it must be transformed in order for me to be renewed, that that's essential, that this old mind that has been shaped and warped by sin and, and led by rebellion and self-centeredness and selfishness would be transformed, would be changed. And, and how does that happen? It, my mind gets renewed, the Bible says. And so God uses his word and uses his people and, and he challenges our mind and he changes the way we think and feel, the way we look at things. So my, our mind is the first area and we spent a couple of weeks looking at the top 10 things that the Bible said about our mind and how God does that and how we're to respond. The second thing was our, was our mouth, which we all know is probably one of the greatest tests that we all have, one of the most continual tests that we all have. And no matter how mature we are in Christ, it's something that's very hard to keep a grip of. As a matter of fact, the Bible itself, James tells us that no man can tame the tongue. We can tame all kinds of animals and we have tamed all kinds of animals and put them under our control. Um, and, but the tongue is something that no man can tame. It takes God to tame the tongue. And so anyway, so we spent a, few, a couple of weeks talking about the top 10 things that the Scripture teaches us about the tongue and how to control it, live it, how, what it should reflect and how, what we should say and what we should refrain from saying and all of that. And then we started on money. And I know that for some people, uh, the conversation about money is something that you may be surprised how much the Bible has to say about money, but it has a great deal to say about money. There are many passages of Scripture that talk about money our, and our use of money and the value and how to, how to appropriate our money and what to do with our money and how to give, and how to avoid risk, and what to invest in, and all of these kind of things. It's really very, God has a great deal to say about money, because, you know, money is part of our life. Uh, um, resources, prosperity, we pray for it all the time. You know, in the prayer of Jabez, right, right. we pray it every Sunday. You know, God bless me a lot. And that's what Jabez prayed, expand my territory, you know, move my fences out. Lord, increase my life. Make me bigger, a bigger person. Make me more prosperous so that I'll have the opportunity to, to give more, to be more responsible to the kingdom is what Jabez is praying in an Old Testament way. But we're, you know, translating it to us and, and we're praying for the Lord to do that in our life. And so in order for that to happen, there are some guidelines. And what I've taken is all of the laws and instructions of money and boil them down to the 10 biggest things that you need to be aware of and that you need to understand as a Christian about, about money in your life. And if you follow these guidelines, then you can open yourself up to uh, be blessed by God and to, to avoid 
those pitfalls that rob us from the resources that God brings into our life. And some of them are very simple. Uh, the first one, now just reflecting back to the five we've already covered quickly, the first one was the law of contentment. And the law of contentment just basically says, if you can't be content with what you have, you will always want more than you need. And you can always outspend your resources, no matter how many much resources you have. And that's not hard to, to see, because we see it all the time with people who have tremendous resources, millions of dollars. Uh, I, think the, I think the statistic, if I'm not mistaken, uh, and they have a, an ESPN film, so if you wanted to go home and Google it and watch it on YouTube, I'm sure it's there. Uh, they had a, one of those 30 for 30 sh short movies from ESPN about uh, athletes and their money. Yes, yes. And, it, and it's about how many of them are bankrupt within a few years of being retired from the NFL, NBA, and Major League Baseball, and, and tennis, and soccer. I mean, these people make like three, four, five million dollars a year or more. And within four or five years after they retire, they're flat busted or filing for bankruptcy. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's just some of the major athletes are, are this way. And rock singers and musicians and uh, lottery winners. You know, Lottery winners are notorious about winning millions of dollars and then being flat busted within a few years. You know, within five years, they're broke again. Well, why is that? Well, it's, they're not, they don't follow the law of contentment. They can't, they can't be satisfied. Uh, they can't find contentment in life. So m more money, more resources, more people, more, all of that. Anyway, the law of contentment is the first law. The second law is the law of budget, and that one is real simple. It means you have to know where your stuff is going. And in order to know where your stuff is going, you have to have some record of what it is and where it's allocated and how much of it's going here and how much of it's going out. And this is a very simple concept to most people. And I know most of you guys here, probably all of you guys here tonight, have a budget or either you've lived long enough to know what your budget is without having to keep like an official, uh, you know, chronicle of it. You, you've lived long enough and you've experienced enough that you know how much it's going to take to pay your house note and pay your power bill and pay your water bill and cable bill, or whatever it is you have. And you, you, you keep make sure that those resources are there when it comes time for them to be paid. But it's just amazing, and I'm serious about this, it's just amazing how many people, young people especially, because usually by the time we get to, to our age, um, and I say our, uh, by the time you get to, you know, you're in your 30s or and 40s on up in there, you either have gotten that concept or you're some kind of vagabond, you know. I don't know how you could live that long and not have gotten that concept. You're still probably looking for a new apartment every time the rent comes due kind of deal because you, you, you don't have enough. But it's, but, but, but it's amazing how many, especially young people, that you come across that really don't have that concept. And I'm thinking, how could you, how could you live 20 years and not think about the fact that there is going to come a moment of time in a few days where 700, 800, 900, however much your rent is, is going to come due. And if you make money back here, some of that money has to stick around so that when you get here, you will have enough to pay this. If you don't, you are going to be homeless. Or they're going to come cut your power off or your water or whatever it might be. And so you have to be able to save some of this because the next time you get paid, you're not going to have enough to cover all of this at one time. So you've got to hold on to some back here. In order. And how simple a concept is that? I mean, who, who wouldn't just naturally know that? But it's amazing. There are 
many of them that don't somehow grasp that concept and or or like this you know you've got certain amount of bills you got you know house notes power notes i mean living bills grocery bills i mean bills to, that you have to pay to eat and to be in a house and to be protected from the elements and have the lights on not, you know, all right, and you got a you got a that level of expense right there, so you can't go buy the new iPhone eight or ten, because you can't spend a thousand dollars on a cell phone, because you got too much owed over here. But I, they'll go get the the cell phone, and it and then and then they don't have enough money for this, and it's like who how do you not know that? How, I mean, what kind of thinking is that going on? But it's amazing. But the law of budget just says financially, and this is what Jesus, I mean, Jesus said no man goes to, no, no, no king goes to battle and doesn't know any, about how many troops he has. To see if he has enough troops to battle the other troops. Jesus said no man builds a house unless he determines that he has enough resources so that when he gets halfway through, he'll have to quit and everybody will laugh at him and say how dumb you are that you started building a house and you didn't know you didn't have enough resources. So the implication is Jesus said, you know, you have, to, you have to think in advance so that you don't run out of resources because no matter how many resources we have, we can all go above our resources no matter what, you know. So anyway, uh, a lot of people pray for mansions, and my question is, if you had a mansion, could you pay the power bill? You know, if, you had, if God gave you that mansion you're paying for, could you pay for the upkeep of it? Could you pay the taxes on, you know, a, a, a million-dollar house and, and 15 acres of land? You know, could you stay in it longer than a year, you know? <laughs> They're going to come take it away from you because you can't pay the taxes on the thing, you know? So anyway, that's the law of budget is to, to get in there and, and, fit, and, and, and uh, examine those things, all right? Then the third law was the law of fish, which this was the scripture where Jesus, where Jesus and the disciples owed money because they were Roman citizens. And, of course, they didn't have money except for what were, was given to them. And so they didn't have money to pay the taxes. And so Jesus told Peter to go down to the, down to the Sea of Galilee and cast in. And the first fish he caught, look in his mouth and get the coin out and go pay the taxes. And that's exactly what he did. And the, the point of that, the, I think the illustration, I think why that's in the scripture is to tell us that when we need resources, the first thing we need to do is to look around our life because what we need may be close at hand if we'll just open up our eyes to look and see what is there. In other words, God can supply for us in lots of ways that we might not see unless we open our spiritual eyes and hear what God says. What else can, the question to ask yourself is, what else can I do? You remember this morning, Wesley read the passage of Scripture about David? You know, when David was called by God and Samuel went out and anointed him at his house, he was a little boy. You remember what those scriptures he read said? It said David was a good-looking young man. He was handsome. He had beautiful eyes. He had red hair and slightly freckled. The Bible calls it ruddy. He was ruddy. He was a nice-looking young man. And it, then it went on to list he was a mighty soldier. He was good at battle. He was an excellent musician. He was a, had a good nature and a good temperament about himself. And above all that, the Lord was with him. So it lists about five or six things about David, and the point is God uses all of the stuff that he put in us. In other words, if you're good looking, hey, work it, man. Make yourself, you know, put your makeup on, look good. You take, take advantage of the fact that God's made you beautiful. Beautiful people have some advantages. I mean, I get all kinds of offers because of, you know, the way I look. <laughs> I mean, beautiful people, we just have a leg up on everybody else. <laughs> I mean, beautiful. In other words, it, yeah, they will come back. Uh, the Lord knows I'm kidding about that. But anyway, uh, <laughs> the, the point is, if you, I mean, whatever advantage you have, work it. 
If you're smart, if, you're, if you have a good way with people, if you're a good fighter, a good soldier, a good organizer, a good administrator, if you play an instrument well, uh, all of those ways that God described David in, in, uh, as Samuel looked at him is just God's way of saying, look at all he can do. And use every bit of it. You know, you know why he got to be in front of Saul? Because he was going to be the next king. You know how David got in the palace? He got in the palace because he could play the harp well. If he couldn't play the harp, he wouldn't be in the palace where he needed to be so he could see what it meant to be king, so he could get in, involved with the servants that surrounded the king so everybody could learn his name and know who he was and, and, and learn to like him and learn to agree with him and be good. Man, that good-looking young man right there, he can play that harp. And whoo, is he a fighter. I tell you what, one of these days when Saul dies, I bet you he could be king, man. I'd, I'd follow him anywhere. I mean, you know, to develop that kind of rapport with the people in the palace, he needed to be in the palace. Well, he couldn't be in the palace if he can't play a harp harp. So the fact that he could play a harp well gave him the opportunity to be where he needed to be. And God said, use that to your advantage. So the law of fish means, what else can I do? If I'm getting low in resources, if I can't make my bills, if I can't pay, I'm working as hard as I can here. Is there something else that I can do? Do I have some stuff in my house that's worth something that I can sell? Is there something in the garage out there that's been out there 10 years? I've never even touched it, which means I don't need it. And, and, and would, it, would it sell? Could we have a garage sale and maybe we can sell that? Or I put it on eBay or some of these sale sites and let's see if we can get rid of that because I don't need it and it'll bring in some resources. You know, is there a second job I could do because I, I have certain skills and I could give, you know, a little bit of time and make some more money and take a little ease in this? That's the law of fish. All right, third law, a fourth law is law of contingency. And law of contingency says what happens if what I think is going to happen doesn't happen. Law of contingency says I need to plan for the unexpected because we all have a plan. You know, it's kind of like one of our theologians, Mike Tyson, said. Mike Tyson says everybody has a plan until you get hit in the mouth. You know, so when you get hit in the mouth, all of a sudden, whatever plan you had is out the window. You know, you got to have a new plan now. Well, the law of contingency says plan for the unexpected. And it's not, it's not unspiritual or unscriptural to plan for what might happen. It's not against God to say in your heart, I know God can do anything, and I know he will bless me, and I know God will you know, protect me and use me, and I'm in God's hands. And God will supply all my needs, Philippians says. All my, not just my spiritual needs, but all my needs. My money needs, my relationship needs, my, my life needs, my family needs. God will supply all my needs according to his riches and glory through Christ Jesus. All right, that's what we believe. But it's not against God to say, well, what happens if what I think is going to happen doesn't happen? Do I have another plan? Do I have contingencies? Like, we all know we're going to die, right? You, know, you do know you're going to die, all right? Something is considered inevitable if we know it's going to happen. Well, death is inevitable. You are going to die unless you're that generation, you know, where Jesus, and we all know that every generation since he left here has felt like they're going to be the generation. So if you believe you're in the generation that will be alive when Jesus comes back, you're in good company because every generation since he left has felt like they are the generation he's coming back. The Apostle Paul didn't even believe he would die, if that tells you anything. So... The odds are that you're not going to be that generation. The odds are that you're going to go to heaven before heaven comes to you. So what happens when you die? What happens to your family? Are they going to be able to make it? See, you're planning to live forever. You're planning to work until you're 85 years old. 
You planning to be able to prov provide and support your family and pay your bills and pay for the house and get a new car? And you're planning for that to happen for the rest of your life. What, what, what if that doesn't happen? What if you have a stroke? What if you, what if you have to go down with heart issues? What if, you, what if you end up being somebody that can't support themselves, much less a family? What, what happens then? What happens if you die and you leave your wife and two or three kids? How, uh, who's going to provide for them? Is she going to have to try to hurry around and look for somebody that's willing to marry somebody that's uh, 50 years old with three kids or 45 years old with three kids? Is that what you want her? You want her in that position? Well, if you don't want that to happen, then you need to have a plan for that not to happen. You need to have some life insurance. You need to have some disability insurance because that might happen. Now, we don't want it to happen. We don't believe it's going to happen. We pray that it won't happen. We're, we're asking God to not let it happen. But if what you plan doesn't happen, do you have contingencies? And I know a lot of people say, oh, that is so unfaithful to God. God, you, God is going to supply me and blah, 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 blah. And to you, I would say, do you have a spare in your car? I'm talking about a spare tire. You have one. Why do you have one? Because just in case you have a flat, you don't want to end up on the side of 49 out here with the traffic flying by and you sitting out there trying to hope somebody you know goes by and will stop and help you, right? You want to be able to pop the trunk, get the stuff out, put it on, and cripple down to some place where you can get that thing fixed. Well, if you believe God for your life, why don't you believe him for the fact he's not going to let you have a flat? So you see how inconsistent we are in our thinking. We, we talk a lot with our mouth, but, but, but the way we live reflects really what we believe. So, you know, you're, you're contrary to yourself if you have a spare and you believe God's going to take care of every other part of your life. I'm just saying that you need to take care of that because what, whatever might, something might happen that you didn't think was going to happen, and then what happens next? Yeah, Bill. Let me add this. All right. Uh, one of the most influential men that I knew in Georgia mm -hmm. was probably one of the most successful bankers in Georgia. He started banks, planted banks, and all that kind of stuff. Right. And he started out picking cotton and all that kind of stuff. And he said his daddy told him, he said, when you get married, and all that kind of, he said, y'all need to have a goal. Right. And he said, I've told lots of people that. And he taught Sunday school or something. Yeah, but he said, set yourself a goal. And it's never too late. Right. Set yourself a goal, and you need to have figure out how much your stuff is a month, and set yourself a goal to where you will have six months work. That if something happens, you you could carry it for six months. Right. And he said, while you're learning to do that, you will learn to to handle your money. Better. Right. And when right. you reach that goal, when you've got six months in there, then it'll just carry on because right. you've already learned. But you have to set a goal. Right. And you that's do. what happens is people don't. They get a bus dumped on them all at one time and they've never had it. Right. Let's talk about this morning. Step by step. Right. It's how we grow. Right. If you get it all at one time, you don't know what to do with it. Yeah. That's exactly but a lot right. Of people hang around to help you with it. You know? Oh, yeah. You have lots well of friends. Try, they're all gone. That's what I've said uh, to people before. You're exactly right. Yeah. And that's what I've said to people before that I knew were going to get big lump sums of money. Uh, been church members, and I knew they were about to get either some inheritance or life insurance or some something has happened, and they're going to get some money. I said, just remember, do not tell people that you have any money, and and don't listen to anybody. I said, don't listen to their stories, don't listen to their plans, because if they know you have money, they're going to have some plan that they've always wanted, and they're going to talk to you about, man, we could do this, and they're going to try to get you to invest in their plan or their scheme or whatever, and you will be flat busted before you know it. Just remember who your friends are before you have money. Remember, remember the ones that loved you when you didn't have a dime, when they had to pull you out of the ditch. Remember those people because those people are the ones that you can have trust in. These newfound fair-weather friends that will take your money and everything else, that's what they are. 
They're just vultures, pretty much, is what it boils around to. And so, and what Billy was saying is the same thing the Lord is saying in these rules, these laws right here, these commandments. The reason people don't have money who get money and, and can't keep it is because they get the money, but they don't have the character that goes with it in order to keep it and use it and, and, and make, if you have to earn it and you have to learn the rules and the laws while you earn it and it's hard and you have to go through trials and you learn things while you're on the way up, when you get up here with a little money, you'll have the character to be able to know what to do with this money and how to handle it. And, and so it's really important that you do this because if you don't, you're going to lose your resources. And God provides these resources for you so that you can use them for the kingdom, so that it can lessen, you know, the issues of your life and you can invest in the kingdom and you can support the work of God. And, you know, I mean, these, you can, then you can spend like he directs you to spend and, and plant seeds, which will be another law we have in a minute. And, and you can do these things. And so uh, be careful is what he says. Uh, these, are, these are laws. These are what, this is what I'm talking about. The scripture has a great deal to say about all this stuff. Uh, the, the fifth law, the last one from last week, a couple of weeks ago, is law of excellence. Law of excellence just means why should God give you more if you're not taking care of what, you, what he's already given you? That cars run better with a little oil in them. Check it every now and then, Right? Yeah, leaky pipes usually don't heal themselves. You usually have to get in there and fix it. Fix it. Take care of your stuff. Don't let your stuff stay broken down around the house. You know, organize things. Take some of that Tupperware and put it somewhere else so that every time you open the door, the whole pile doesn't just fall out on you, you know. I mean, look at life. Get, a, get you a backhoe and clean out that car, you know and the back seat full of trash, and people can't even get in. And every time you open the door, you have to start apologizing to somebody. But, oh, well, you know, and then excusing why it looks like some kind of pigsty up in there. I mean, be excellent. Keep things clean. Keep things oiled. Keep things in the right working condition. Know where your tools are. Organize stuff, you know. Make it where when you walk in your shed, you don't have to spend 15 minutes looking for that screwdriver that you know is in here somewhere and I just can't find it because it's just piled up with a whole bunch of junk, you know. Be an excellent person is what it says. And, and it'll bless your life and your stuff will last longer. Why should God give you more when you're not using what you have, right? You know, I mean, it'd be like you. Think about you and your children, all right? Think about the fact that you give your children something that's valuable and you say, this is something I'm going to give you. It's going to make life better for you. You can use this and it's going to help you. And you can really, this can be a blessing to you. And so here it is. Take care of it. Uh, I'm giving it to you because, so you can be blessed. And then you go over to their house and you find it sitting on the front porch just about where, when you gave it to them, they set it down on the front porch. It's out in the weather and the humidity and the dogs are sniffing around it and everything. And it's been out there for about four weeks and you knock on the door and you look and it's sitting right there where it was four weeks ago. But now because of the salt air and the humidity down here, everything's beginning to rust on it and it's beginning to wither away and the thing won't crank anymore. Now, how, are you, do you, how does that make you feel? Does that make you say, you know, I really need to give them something else. I really need to really, you know, they love me and they love what I gave and they're responsible and I really need to just bless them more. No, you look at it and say, those suckers, I'm taking this back and I'm not going to give them anything again. Well, there you go. There you go. That's what God says. If you're not going to use what I give you and you're not going to be responsible and you're not going to appreciate it, and you're not going to treat it with respect and take care of it so it, it, when you need it, it'll be there, and, and then, then I don't think you have the right to ask God for more. And I think if you do ask God for more, he said, hey, use, what, use what I've already given you. You know, how about that? See, you're going to learn a lesson. I'm reminded of give thanks with a grateful heart. Yeah, give thanks with a grateful heart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, Absolutely. And so these are just, see, I mean, these are just common sense stuff, but you would be shocked to know how uncommon this sense is. 
<laughs> People talk a lot about common sense. Well, it's very uncommon now, these days especially. What is going to happen with this generation that we have coming on? I'm, I mean, I don't know if it's because I'm getting old or whether, I don't know what it is, but I look at this generation coming on and I think you guys are a bunch of, what? how are you going to survive? You don't have concept. You don't have any idea of certain concepts that it's going to take to live. How are you going to live and survive when you don't understand this? It's like you're blind to it. Now, that just might be me getting older and like my grandparents thought the same thing about me, you know, and my parents thought the same thing about me maybe. Uh, and now I'm at the age where I'm looking at life like that. You know, I don't know. That just might be it. Or it might be that, that we got a lot of praying and a lot of teaching to do. You know, both. We spend what we Holy have, smokes. Nowadays you, can spend what you, don't you can spend a lot of what you don't have. Right. You know, nowadays it's amazing. Uh, kid, you know, back when, and I'm, I'm rambling now, but... Back when, uh, when we were growing up, my generation, the baby boomers, uh, we baby boomers were taught that if you go to college, just, you're going you're gonna to have a, a leg up in life. If you go to college, our parents believed going to college was almost like magic. Our parents believed, and this was because of the environment they came out of. They came through the Great Depression and all of that, and, they, and, and to them an education was a way out of the environment that they were in. So they believed that if they could just get us baby boomers through college, that we could have a good life, that college meant uh, an advance, college meant a leg up. So, so uh, commercialism and materialism and advertisement still plays on that today. We act as if college today means the same thing to this generation as it meant to our generation, but it doesn't. I mean, there's no advantage to it today. The only advantage you have to it today is if you go and are trained in something specific that you need that degree in order to work in that field. If you don't, all you're doing is putting yourself into a propaganda situation where they're going to try to teach you a lot of things that are contrary to what we teach and believe in life, and you're going to pay them $150,000, $200,000 to do it, and by the time you graduate, you won't even be able to get a job good enough to pay back your student loan. So what I'm saying is that you have to be wise. You have to, you have to pay attention, and, and, and every, you know, the the concept of everybody going to college and just going to make you better and blah, blah. You need, to, you need to get out of that because that is not true anymore. And when you teach your children and train your children, the Bible says that your responsibility as a parent is to train up your child in the way in which he should go. Train up your child in the way in which he shall go, not you shall go. Not what you are sad you didn't live up to. Not to your concept of what's right. But your child, God has a purpose for your child. God's created your child with certain properties and propensities and personalities and abilities and natures. And, and you as a parent are to know your child well enough to know what feels and what work and what life they're going to be best equipped for. Train up a child in the way in which he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. It means when he gets old, he'll be happy still that he followed that path. So my job as a parent is to know my child well enough that I can direct my child, I can encourage my child toward what God has created him to be interested in in life. If my child is a socially withdrawn person and really doesn't like being around people, then don't get him in a job 
where it's going to put him in contact with the, with the public all the time. And I mean, this person's not going to be a salesman at a retail outlet or those kind of things. This person needs the kind of job that can be worked behind the scenes and sitting in front of maybe a computer screen and having a great life, making a lot of money, doing things that doesn't involve a, you know, a personality type issue. If my child's outgoing and forward and happy around people and, you know, doesn't meet a stranger and all that kind of stuff, then my child has an opportunity to take advantage of that kind of a nature and sell refrigerators to Eskimos. I mean, you know, uh, in other words, we, and we are supposed to know them well enough to be able to guide them in those ways. That's the responsibility of a parent. Now, how I got off on that, I guess I'm just talking about excellence here. Well, thank you. Thank you, Lars. <laughs> Maybe I'm... But anyway, I'm talk, I know I'm preaching to the choir because all of you guys are, I mean, this is, I know the people online can't see you guys that are here, but uh, I'm talking to the choir because all these people already know this, but maybe I'm talking to somebody you know, like you out there. I don't know where, what, where this may be going, but anyway, that's it. Let me go on. Let me go on. Let me go on. Bree, did you, were you praising the Lord or you just raised your hand? <laughs> Thank you, Bree. I appreciate it. Well, good. Praise the Lord. I know you. I know. Probably Mitch and Sharon is helping them too. I can't. <laughs> oh, seriously. All right. Here we go. The sixth law. The law of the seed. The law of the seed. Now, depending on who you listen to in preaching and teaching, this law can be uh, very good information to you, very helpful to you, or it can be Christian magic. And by that, I mean there are many teachers that you could probably turn to on any channel. If you went and Googled the law of the seed or anything about the seed, planting a seed, you could find probably hundreds of messages from multiple, multiple teachers and even people you respect very much that would be just as wacky about this as you could possibly imagine. They will be teaching you stuff that is just nothing but Christian magic. Like, you plant your seed, and it's going to give you a great return. You plant a seed, and God's going to give you a thousand times back what you planted. You know, you sow into the harvest. You invest into the harvest, by the way, which they're talking about, give me your money. That's what they're talking about. They're not talking about you finding some poor person in your church and investing in them. They're talking about you getting online and sending them your credit card number or whatever and giving them. That's what they're talking about. Giving them your seed, and they'll send you a blessed handkerchief back or some magic holy water or something or another, some kind of rag that they've sweated on or something or another. And then it's going to magically give you everything that you want. See, they're taking advantage of your greed is what they're doing. And they're teaching you that God will bless your greediness because you want 10000 I mean, think about that. If I give $100 and I get, you know, $1,000 back, really what they're teaching is that God can quadruple your money. I mean, it's like a bet or something. It's like, a, you know, you give $10, God's going to give you 1000 back. It's, and all that's doing is encouraging you to be greedy in life, which fits right into humanity. It fits right into the carnal mind that wants what it wants all the time. And, um, and, 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 but that's not what the Scripture teaches about the seed. It does teach about the seed that if you will invest in the kingdom, that God will bless your life in return. As a matter of fact, it says that uh, he that sows sparingly will reap sparingly, but he who sows bountifully shall reap bountifully. It also says uh, that I reap what I sow. Be not deceived, for God is not mocked, Galatians says. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Mm -hmm. If he sows to the flesh, he shall of the flesh reap rotten flesh. If he sows to the Spirit, he shall reap everlasting life. When the rich young ruler came to Jesus, what did Jesus tell the guy to do to get to heaven? 
He said, sell everything you have and give the money to the poor. That's what he said. And I know everybody that reads that and then come and follow me. I know everybody that reads that said, man, that is so drastic, you know? Well, so was the cross. <laughs> I'll get to that on the last principle down here. The, cr the cross was a drastic thing. Jesus gave everything on the cross. So what he's teaching here about the seed is that my seed is a statement of a goal in my life. It, it, all right, let me, let me back up and say this to you. Two things about money in your life and your responsibility to give. Number one, the tithe is first. I know that there are lots of teachers that teach you that the New Testament does not teach you to tithe. And I know that Malachi 3, where we quote about, in, you know, about bring you all the tithes into the storehouse that there might be meat to eat, and, um, and, and God will, the worms that eat your crops and all that, God will just, you know, get rid of them so that you can have a crop. In other words, many teachers teach that the Old Testament teaches that if you want to break the curse on finances, then you tithe. Because tithing, the word tithe means one-tenth. That's all the word means. If you translate the word tithe and you don't explain it, you don't try to, uh, you know, elongate it in any way, you just explain what that word is. You just directly translate the word tithe, it would be one-tenth. So uh, when you see the word tithe, it means one-tenth. So what in the Old Testament, God was saying one-tenth of everything you have belongs to God. So you bring that one-tenth to the storehouse. What is the storehouse? This is the storehouse. This is the place where we all meet. This is the place where we all receive instruction. This is the place where we come to be blessed, to hear the word of God, to be encouraged, to be given instruction. Uh, this is the place we come to, to be together, to pray for one another. This is the storehouse. The storehouse is not your Aunt Susie's house. And people say, well, you know, I feel like God wanted me to give my tithe to Susie because she's having trouble paying her power bill. Well, you better hope Susie can bless you because that's where your blessing's going to come from. And I'm just going to say that means you ain't getting nothing because you know Susie and she ain't got a dime and she won't have a dime. You bring the tithe to the storehouse. Now, that's what the Old Testament teaches about our responsibility to God. 1 Corinthians 16 in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul, speaking about giving to the poor, Paul says to the church in 1 Corinthians 16, if you read it, the first two verses, it says, look, you guys, when you come to church every week, you bring money in proportion to your prosperity. In other words, it teaches a percent, percentage giving, like the ones of you that have more money bring a larger amount of money. The ones of you that have less money bring a smaller, but bring a, bring a, a fraction, bring a proportion, like a tenth is a portion. So if you make a lot of money, one tenth is more money than if you make a little bit of money. But you're all responsible for a part in this. And you bring it to the storehouse so that when I get there, we won't have to take up a bunch of offerings and try to have a bunch of uh, pledges and responsibilities and, and money-raising schemes and plans so I can get this money to these poor churches who need it. So the concept of being responsible for giving in the New Testament is taught just like being responsible in the Old Testament. But here's the kicker. The kicker is that in the Old Testament, we are strictly taught by the law. The law says 10% of your money belongs to God, and if you keep it, you're stealing it from God. And you're going to get a curse for that. God's going to curse you, and your crops are not going to produce, and your land is not going to grow, and the palmer worm and the canker worm and any other kind of worm is going to come eat up your crops, and it's going to fall on the ground, and you're going to lose because you're stealing from God because you're keeping the tithe. In the New Testament, 
the Bible is even more strict than that. In the New Testament, the Bible teaches that all of it belongs to God. Not just a tenth, but all of it belongs to God. Go sell everything you have and give that money to the poor and then come follow me and you'll see the kingdom of heaven, Jesus said to the young ruler. So our responsibility in the New Testament is even greater than the responsibility of the Old Testament where one-tenth is responsible. Now he says, everything you have is given to me and then I'll let decide what you get to keep. So if you want to get real strict about it, you may say, no, tithing's really not taught in the New Testament. Well, you better hope it is because if it isn't, that's what the other alternative is, 100% of everything that belongs to that you have belongs to God, which it does. And what God is saying is, look, everything you have belongs to me. So as I direct you, you give what I direct you to give, and then you have the responsibility to live with the rest of the stuff. So that's really pretty much it. But the law of the seed, I know I'm kind of going off course here a second, but the law of the seed is after you give your tithe, after you give the responsibility of the percent of resources bringing it to the storehouse every week, then you can give above that what is called a seed. And a seed just simply means I see my life as a field out here. And this field has good ground in it. And I see the future of my life, and I see in the future of my life, in this field out here, I see a certain size crop I need. Now, that crop is based on what you believe God has for you in your future. And so, into that good field out there, I, I plant, now just picture in your mind seed representing what you can give, what you can invest, what you can, I mean, it might be money, it might be time, it might be talent, it might be, you know, good words and goodwill and good, I mean, there are lots of ways to, to have a seed, something you have of value, something you have that is a resource that can be invested in others. I know some of you, you know, you may not have a lot of money, but you have talents and you freely give these talents to somebody's life so their life can be blessed because of your ability to give and you have a good word and a good nature and a good response and you give things and you bring things to people. And I, I mean, these are all seeds. It's not just like cash, but it's other things that are positive investments into, into life. Well, you see your life as a big field out here, and, and here you have a handful of what's called seed. All right, now, how, how many seeds you put in that field out there is going to reflect what you think your life needs for the future? In other words, this seed represents what you believe is, is, is what you need out there. If you need big resources out there, you're going to have to plant a lot of seed. But if you think, if you're looking at your life and you say, you know, I'm not going to really need very much. I mean, I'm pretty much got it, you know, under control. And I'm not, I don't think I'm going to need really God's help a lot in the resources of life. Then you don't need very many seeds. You can have a little small bunch of seeds and plant them in the field out there. But if you do that, you're going to get a little bitty crop. If you want a big crop, you got to sow a lot of seed. If you believe in the future, you're going to need more. You're going you're gonna, to you're gonna expect more. Your, your life is going to broaden and expand and be, you know, be blessing and have responsibility. And, and you're going you're gonna to need a lot of help from God and resources. Then you're going to have to plant a lot of seed out there. Because what you sow, God says, if you sow sparingly, you reap sparingly. But if you sow bountifully... You shall reap bountifully, and whatever you sow, that's what you're going to reap. And if you sow a lot, God's going to give it back to you if in good measure, he said, pressed down and shaken together, which is like, uh, how many of you have ever cooked anything with like confectioner sugar or that kind of thing? You know how when you pour it in there, now I'm not a cook, but I've watched Tanya do it a lot. 
But, but I know that when she puts it in a measuring spoon or something, she puts the little confectioners in, and then she taps it because there's a lot of, it's very fine and puffy and a lot of air, so when you tap it down, it gives room to pour more in there because if you don't, you're not going to put enough because you're putting a lot of air in there. But God, good measure, pressed down, shaken, tapped down, put more, and running over. Well, God given to your bosom. So that's the promise. And that's what seed is. Seed is uh, a statement of a goal in my life. My goal is to be bigger. My goal is to be broader. My goal is to be more reflective of God. My goal is to be an investor into people's life. My goal is to be a greater Christian example. Uh, that's my goal. Well, if that's your goal, what reflects your goal is called your seed. And you invest your seed into that good cultivated field out there that God has put, and your seed is going to grow a crop. But you can't, you can't invest seed unless you tithe, because your tithe is the basic responsibility of giving your resources into the storehouse so that the storehouse can have meat to eat and have a place to be. I mean, honestly, I don't know what people think. I don't know, you know, we have people that they come to church and when they're here, they give. Some of them give $5 and think that's a lot. Some people give $10. I'm thinking, do you live off $100 a week? You know, I mean, if you do, you're really doing a good job. You know, some people give $100. But that's, but, but that's not a tithe. That's just what they give every week. And if they're not here, the next time they're here, they don't bring the week they missed. They just, it's like making a payment for the show of what was happened while you were here. That's not tithing. It's not being responsible to God. That's just, you know, tipping at the show, so to speak, or paying for whatever you see. Uh, I guess they think that when the power bill comes in, we go down to the power company and say, hey, we're a church. And they say, well, that's okay then. You don't have to pay it. <laughs> no, man, we got to pay it. We got to pay the insurance. We got to pay, you know, we even have to buy um, insurance that uh, insures us against uh, people making charges of sexual harassment and me being charged with some kind of crime or something or another or molesting somebody and all that kind of stuff. I, we have to carry all that kind of insurance just in case that happens. Somebody's slipping when they go out the door. Somebody's stumbling at the altar. Or, you know, all that kind of stuff. And, uh, and so, it, in other words, it, the storehouse costs money. Yeah, yeah. And so, if we want our storehouse to be here, then we're going to have to make sure we invest enough, led by the Spirit of God, to make sure it's here. And I know I'm preaching to the choir, but I'm really, I don't know who may be watching. I hope somebody, if you, that's your thought that you're hearing, right, that you're hearing what you need to hear because I'm just trying to tell you the truth. You know, I mean, I'm not getting anything from anybody as far as I know in any different. And if we got a lot more, I wouldn't get a lot more because it's already decided. I mean, I'm not getting a percentage of everything is what I'm telling you. But, but I'm just try, I'm trying to say to you that the seed is not magic like, like some teach that it is. The seed is not a scheme whereby you, you trick God into giving you a lot for a little. You're not gambling with God. The, the seed is an investment that you intentionally enter into because God has shown you a big purpose for your life and there's a big field out there and you need a big crop. So you need to invest lots of seed into that crop into that field so when your crop comes in, it'll be a big crop. And he says, if you'll do that way, if you'll measure it out with a, with a, with a, with a, back, with a front end loader, I'll give it back to you with a front end loader. If you measure it out with a teaspoon, I'm going to give it back to you with a teaspoon. You decide how you want to receive from God. You decide how you want God to give it back. And here's the thing. God may give it back to you, not in a monetary way. I know everybody's saying, man, if I give a lot of seed, I'm going to strike, I'm going to get the lottery. No, it doesn't mean that. It means, God, look, I'm going to tell you something. I'm 62 years old. 
In the last 10 years of my life, I've worked for two Fortune 500 companies that I had absolutely no uh, training in whatsoever. I've been hired by two companies that paid me lots of money to do something I had no idea whenever I, I just, I just signed up and they said, hey, come to work for us and this highly technical issue and do these great big technical responsibilities and we're going to pay you this much money and you're going to have this many benefits and resources. And I said, all right. And they went in and, and, and I, I, I started learning everything I needed to learn about all of that. And man, it just came so natural and easy. And I became like one of the biggest, greatest one of whatever. And I'm like, I mean, I'm 55, 60 years old, and, and I'm telling you, you know what that is? That's a seed of God coming back to root. And then I went to another job five years after that because the hours became too much in the first job, and, and, uh, and I worked in a totally different field, not even remotely like the first field with the same thing. But I'm, you know, I'm 58 or 59 by this time. And, and now I get hired by this big company to do something totally different. Don't know anything about it. Don't know how to do it. Don't even know what it's about. And yet they hire me to do this and they pay me this much money and give me this many resources and all this kind of stuff. And I go in there and within like three or four weeks, I'm totally responsible for a Every, almost everything, and I, and I had no idea coming in, but I, but I can do it, and it's just like I learn it and know it, and my physicality, I can physically do this and all of this kind of stuff, and I'm just telling you, I realize that that is a seed coming to fruit that I've sown in life because God gives me the ability to physically do this and mentally do this and to be challenged by this, and now I'm in a new job, and uh, God, I, I fully expect God to bless just the same way, if not more, because now I'm in a job where I also am working with somebody who's planted big crops and big seed, and his crops are coming in, and we're going to be together, and it's going to be a blessing to, to everybody. I, I really believe that. And see, that, that's what I'm saying to you. Uh, it, it's, not, it's, it's not magic. It, it's not greed. It's not... Uh, uh, you're wanting something in return. It's, a, it's, a, it's an issue of the heart. It's an issue of the spirit. It's an issue of the soul that we become a giving person. The Bible says, uh, don't give grudgingly or, or don't, don't, don't give because somebody gets up here and get, tells you a sob story. Don't, I mean, as a matter of fact, when you start seeing somebody do that, you just need to turn off. You just need to say, but that's God, that ain't, that ain't going to be from God. He said, don't give because you've, somebody's persuaded you to give. Don't give grudging like, oh, I don't want to give, but I, I got to give because people, I mean, people are going to think I'm a stingy Grinch. And I mean, if you give like that, keep your money in your pocket. Because you're not being blessed by God. He said, don't give grudgingly or, or of, a, of, a, of, a, of a nature that's been uh, shamed into giving or coerced into giving. You've heard a bunch of sob stories and you feel sorry for people and all that, which is about 99% of what you hear on, on most stages nowadays. But because, and it goes on, it says, because God loves a cheerful giver. God loves somebody who gives with no ulterior motive with no thought of, well, if I give, God's going to give it back to me. I'm going, ooh, bless God, I'm going to give it. I've actually had people that I've listened to on stage, seriously, that told the congregation to write in the back of your Bible. That tells you it was a little while ago because people actually carried their Bible like a book. And right in the back, the top five things you need in life. Like you need your mortgage paid off. You need a new automobile. The top five, you need kids' college education, the top five things you need in life, and then hold your seed up. In other words, get some cash out of your pocket, hold it up, or a check, hold it up, and say, Lord, this is my seed, and I'm investing, and these are the things I need in life, and then put that in the offering, and God's going to start blessing you with one of these five things. What is that? What is that? That is just total corruption of the principle of God. That is just total greed. 
total, that, that's, that's, you are being coerced into that. And God said, what you, when that starts happening, put your money in your pocket, get up and get out of there because that ain't, God's not even a thousand miles from someplace like that. That's just some huckster up on the t- stage taking advantage of you as God. That, that's, a, that's a false shepherd fleecing the flock. That's what that is. I mean, what my responsibility as a pastor is to walk right up there and say, get off the stage and get out of this building because you're not from God. So, you know, this is the law of the seed. So hopefully, I mean, have I overdone that? I mean, is that too much preaching about that? (laughs) Okay, move on. Move on. Uh Uh-oh, this one will really get you. The law of credit. The law of credit. Law 7. Now, I'm, I'm not teaching, and I want to say this up front, because all of us sitting here have credit, and we buy things on credit. I know we do. So I'm not sitting here telling you that we should never use credit, because I'm telling you I have stuff that I'm buying on credit, like my house. Uh, I, I don't have a car note because my, the truck I drive is 18 years old, and the car my wife drives is 10 years old, and we paid them off. We did have a note on them until we paid them off. Uh, my house, I have about five more years on my house, and it's going to be paid off. Uh, we have a credit card that we use for the church and a credit card we personally use. We keep them separated. So if the IRS or anybody else wants to check us, our church account, here it is, here are the books, here are all the money, here are the spent. You know, Bev's one of the signers, and she checks it every month, and Tanya checks it, and several others check it. Uh, so it's totally responsible. And then here's our personal stuff over here, and we spend thousands of dollars in a month, and when the, when the bill comes in, we pay every bit of it off. So we start with zero at the start of next month. And we use it because it's, it, nowadays it's easier to use because uh, carrying money around can be dangerous. It can, you know, it's just, it, it, it's, it's easier to just use the debit or use a credit and then pay it. But if you do that, you need to pay it every month. You don't need to let it sit there and accumulate because that interest that it accumulates is eating your crop up. It's killing you. If you have credit card troubles, which many people do, most people do actually, the average is that people have three credit cards. This is the average now of, this, of people in the USA. The average person has three credit cards to the max with about $5,000 worth of credit on each card. So most people have about $15,000 worth of credit debt on about three different cards, and it's eating them up. They can barely make the minimum payment. The law of credit says, God says, you know, to, to, to not do that, to be responsible, that when you borrow something, that it's a great responsibility you have to be able to repay what you borrow. Now, let's just take it from, uh, think about this. Think about, stop thinking about money for a second and think about the fact like you have, you have a neighbor and uh, let's just say, all right, let's just say that your, your, uh, a hurricane blows your fence down and your neighbor has one of these, um, one of these post diggers these, with a motor, motorized post digger and you're going to have to put up like 45 fence posts to put your fence back up and your neighbor has one and your neighbor says, hey, you want to borrow my fence digger? And you say, man, yeah, that'd be great. Woo! And so you start digging, digging. You get about 15 holes dug, and all of a sudden, you, you hit some rock down there or something, and it breaks, it breaks something in there. Now, according to the Scripture, it's your responsibility to fix it. And if you can't fix it, you've got to buy him a new one. In the Scripture, in, in 2 Kings 6, Elisha was Elisha had a school for the prophets. It was like a seminary where the young preacher boys went, and Elisha taught them to be like a prophet like him. And they were building a school building, and they were chopping down trees, and one of the students, the axe head, steel axe head, metal axe head, flew off of the end of the stick and went into the water and was lost in the water. 
And the student came crying to Elisha and was all torn up about this. And here was why. It says, for the axe head was borrowed. Now, what, why, why did that make him so upset? What was the deal with that? Why did the scripture record that that was a big deal that it was borrowed? Because the law was, if you, lo if you lost something that was borrowed or you broke it, you've got to repair it or buy them a new one. And the little student didn't have any money to buy a new axe head or any resources to get a new one. And so he came crying to the man of God, come and do something. Can you do something about this? And so Elijah went down there, and um, Elisha, when I get to heaven, I'm going to talk to him about that Elisha and Elijah junk. Elisha went down and, uh, and, put a, and, and put a stick over the water, and the axe head swam up to the stick and got on the stick. Amazing, right? All right, but what that miracle was teaching us is don't borrow something if you can't afford to replace it. And think about it before you borrow it. Am I willing to replace this or repair this if I borrow it and it breaks? Now, if you're willing to do that, then great, borrow it. But if you can't do it, if you can't fix it or replace it, don't borrow it. Because if you break it and you can't replace it, you've lost a friend. You've now built a fence between you and somebody because you borrowed their stuff and you broke it and you can't fix it. So the best thing to do, according to the scripture, is if you borrow something, you put some what is called surety, which means you put, a, you put something down. You know, you borrowed the fence digger, you say, here's my lawnmower. All right, if I can't return this fence digger to you, this pole digger to you in good, in good operating order, just like I got it, you can have my lawnmower. And the guy says, hey, that's a good trade. I'll take it. Very good. Now, if you don't break the fence digger, you give him the fence digger back, then you get your lawnmower back. If not, he gets your lawnmower because you couldn't afford to fix his stuff. And now you haven't lost them because you agreed before you started. This is a good trade and I'll take that trade. And okay, you're a responsible person. So if you borrow it, it the scripture says it, it is the, it's the wicked who borrow and don't repay. The righteous don't borrow stuff and bring it back. And how many <laughs> of us have borrowed stuff and didn't bring it back. I mean, can you think of how many things have been borrowed from you, quote, borrowed from you, and it's sitting at somebody else's house right now because when they got through, they didn't bring it back. Huh? It's just a testimony. It's just a, it's just a word about that. And, I mean, does that change your opinion of a person? Well, sure it does. Go ahead, brother. that deal about borrowing stuff, too? Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. So, so mm -hmm. Don't borrow it if you can't fix it. That's what I'm saying, and you're exactly right. Don't come back with this stuff of, well, it was old. Me, me. Look, you should have got that all settled before you started with the it thing. You, you know? That's right. I took care of it. It, it was old because it lasted long enough to me be old. And here's another thing, and this is very difficult to do. It's hard to do this because usually it's somebody you love that asks you to, to co-sign a loan. Listen, the Bible specifically, let me read you this passage so you'll see. The Bible says, do not co-sign for somebody else. Listen to it. Here's the scripture. It's in Proverbs 22. It's in your notes. I, I actually put it in the notes, not just on the scripture page. It says, don't agree, Proverbs 22, 26, and 27. Listen to it. I mean, you don't even have to translate this. You don't need a preacher to tell you what this means. Don't agree to guarantee another person's debt or put up security for someone else. If you can't pay it, even your bed will be snatched from under you. Now, I'm just going to use some common sense here. And tell, let me just tell you, I've had to turn down uh, people I love on this. And I turned them down, and here's what I said. 
when they ask me about this, Tartania and I about this, you know, we'll, we need you to do this because we don't have the credit that we can do this and we need this. And I, my response is, I love you too much to do this. Because you know why somebody needs a co-signer? Because the bank says they're, they can't pay it back. And you know what? 50% of the time, they're right. 50% of the bank loans that are co-signed, on average, the co-signer has to finish paying the loan. 75% of finance companies, the co-signer has to pay the rest of the loan. So those aren't good odds. Whether you whether you co, whether your co-signer is dealing with the bank or a finance company, the odds are you are going to end up paying that loan back. And I'm going to tell you what it's going to do to you. It's going to mess up that relationship because you're going to see them on a vacation in Cancun down there with all their pictures on Facebook about what a great time they're having, and you're sitting up here having to repay their loan and just seething with anger because they're using your money. Yeah, that's your, or they drive by in a new automobile and honk the horn and wave while you out uh, digging in your yard because you couldn't get somebody else to do it because you were paying back the money they owed you, and they're driving your car down the road. So this is, this is what the Scripture teaches, and you'll be wise if you'll obey this. It's hard to do. It's hard to turn somebody down that you love, but you, you have to because it's going to mess your relationship up. I guarantee you it is if you do it. And uh, if, you, if, if you could do, if you can do that uh, and you somehow get by with it, just count yourself blessed because uh, that's not... Uh, that's not usually what happens. Now, let me ask you something. Do you think that it, that it has any influence on the world whether you pay your bills or not? Do you think that your financial life has a testimony to the world out there? Do you think, you think that if you go somewhere and it's known that you don't pay your bills and yet you claim to be a Christian, do you think that that has a good reflection on the kingdom of God or a bad reflection? You think if you walk into a store and you try to use the fact that you're a Christian to say, I'm gonna, that means I'm going to repay my bills, but that store owner has had a bunch of Christians who still owe him money, and he let them have it because he thought Christians we're right, good, righteous people, but he's learned his lesson that that's just a word people use to try to take advantage of you. Or preachers, you know. Matter of fact, I had a bank, banker that I knew said one time to me, I mean, I knew him really well, and he said to me, he said, uh, he said, uh, uh, we, it, it's very difficult to loan to the three Ps. Now, this is what he said, so if anybody's watching this, one of these Ps, don't get mad at me. Because this is what he said. I said, the three Ps. He said, yep, policemen, painters, and preachers. That's the three worst people to lend to. Policemen, <laughs> painters, and preachers. I don't know why. Now, I'm a preacher, so I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm biting a bullet myself. But I'm just telling you that it does matter what kind of reputation you have financially. It reflects bad on the kingdom if you don't pay your bills. So that's the law of credit. If you have credit card trouble, uh, just a word of financial thought here. I'm not, I'm not a financial planner, but just to show you what God has done in my life and our life, um, if you do have like a mountain and it looks like, oh my goodness, man, I'm never going to get this paid off, uh, you have to start somewhere. Uh, of course, you always got to pay your minimums, you know. I mean, there's obviously you can't just totally not pay whatever you owe, you, and you're just going to have to tread water by paying the minimum. And by the way, if you pay the minimum, you'll never get it paid off. So if you're paying the minimum, just get ready to pay that the rest of your life because you're not going to, the interest is going to eat you up. Uh, but but get the get the debt. Now, a lot of people, this is where they get messed up. They say, I want to get out from under this burden, so I'm going to get the one I owe the most, and we'll try to start paying that off first. No, get the one with the highest interest first. 
If one of them's like 22% and one of them's 10%, pay the 22% off. That's the one that's eating your lunch right there. That's the one that's killing you. So if you got any extra money, once you pay the minimums over here, dump it on this one where you got the most interest because that's the one that's eating you up. So get him, get him paid off first, and then you can start working on these other ones and, and get them paid down and quit buying everything that your eyes see. Every time you think you need something, say, do I really need that? I have, I've had people, here's what they did. They took a gallon milk jug, they cut the top of it off, they put the credit card in the milk jug, put it in the, refri in the freezer, let the thing kind of harden a little bit, pull the credit card up to the right in the middle of that ice jug, and then let it stay right there. And whenever they needed to buy something, they had to wait for the ice to melt in order to get the card, and that gave them enough time to think about, do I really need this? I mean, that's a very creative way, but I guarantee you this impulse buying stuff, if you had to wait for that thing to fall out, you might change your mind and you might say, you know, I don't really need that. Give time for the Lord to speak to you about that. Give, give time for the Lord to, uh, to, to get to your heart and say, you don't really need that. You need, hey, think about that. You know, you got all you got a you got a garage full of that stuff. You got you can't even get your car in the garage because your garage full of stuff. You can't even sell it at a yard sale because you know you just had to have it and there it is. And, you know, and it's been out there for five years. You never don't even know where it is. Whenever you trip over it in the garage, you look at it and say, "Oh, that's where that was, man. I don't know where that was," which is just a testimony of I haven't been responsible financially. All right, let me go to the next one. Because we're moving right on. The law, law eight is the law of work. <laughs> oh, yeah. Law eight is the law of work. What is it we pray for? We pray for finances. We pray for resources, right? You know, there's some people at the altar up here on Sunday morning. You know what they're praying for? Finances. They're praying, saying, Lord, I need some more money. I need more finance. Lord, I need more resources. Lord, I need some provisions in my life. Right? Lord, I, I need the enemy. I need the, the, I need the worms to be rebuked from my life. I need the thief to stop stealing my resources. And, and I need more than I have. And you know what the answer to that prayer is? One word, three letters. You know what it is? Job. An answer to that prayer is get a job. You need more resources? Get a job. You need more finance, get a job. You need, you need extra stuff in your life? Hey, what else can I do? Get a job. Yeah, it's just, it's just uh, ridiculous. You know, I see, I see sweet people, and I'm going to say ladies because, you know, I, I, I believe God holds the husbands accountable for being the provider for their families. It doesn't mean a wife can't work, so don't get all bent out of shape. And it doesn't mean that she can't make a lot of money. I'm just saying that the Bible teaches that men have three responsibilities, protector, provider, and priest. It means I'm to protect my family from everything. Internal, external, on, online, knocking on my front door, or whatever it might be, it's my responsibility to protect my family from being infested, invaded, or harmed by any enemy some philosophy of some teacher or whatever it might be, God holds me. I'm the protector of my home, and God holds me responsible. Provider means it's my responsibility to provide for my family, which means if somebody needs to work more, it's me. I'm, God's holding me responsible, and if, I, my, if my wife has great talents and skill and she's got a great job and she can provide, wonderful. That's awesome, and that's just, I mean, there's no, there's no curse about that and there's no whatever, but, but it's my responsibility that God holds me for, and then priest means it's my responsibility to uh, determine the spiritual opportunities of my family. I pray over my kids. I wake them up on Sunday morning and say, get up, let's get to church. I don't want to hear that. Let's go. It's time to go. Uh, get, to, get down there to the teaching. Get to youth. Uh, uh, look, we're going to pray tonight. We're, here's the Bible. Let's read these verses together. You know, I mean, I'm the priest. I'm the one. I don't wait on my wife to do it. I don't make my wife be the most spiritual person in the home. I'm responsible for that in my home. Well, to, to, to go to... to say all that, I say that I see far more often than I really would want to see, I see young ladies, 
some very beautiful, very talented, sweet people and all that, but they're so sick. I'm, I mean, they need, they need help. Uh, they need instruction. They need prayer because they can attach themselves to some of the, the, the people that are going nowhere. And it's like, you know, if you think that you have found your soulmate, you say, oh, pastor, he's just my soulmate. All right, let me give you two questions to ask. Number one, where do you go to church? And if he stutters or stumbles around on that, and uh, uh, goodbye, goodbye. You got to explain something to me, you know. Where do you go to church? Well, I, I, I went to church, and uh, that pastor, so, uh, and I and got Bob, and, and he's got this long, convoluted story about why he doesn't go to church anymore, and it's really somebody else's fault besides his. Just here's what you say, goodbye, goodbye. You are not the man for me. That's not what I want in my life. You going nowhere but down, and you're not dragging me down with you. I'm not hooking my train to a sinking ship. If he passes the first question on where you go to church, the second question is, where do you work? What kind of job do you have? If he stutters on that one, it's goodbye too. If it's, hey, I do this and I do that, and he's got some double-jointed explanation as to why he doesn't work. How long have you been there? Can you stay there more than two or three weeks? I mean, how many jobs, how many jobs, different jobs have you worked in the last three years? When do, do you show up for work? How many days have you missed? You know, I mean, look, these are just basic questions, and, and this is the responsibility of, for the finances of your life. And God says, uh, look, you know, the law is no work, no eat. That's what he said. If a man... Not if a man can't work, because I think there's a lot of difference between somebody who can't work, who, 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 who is crippled or, or hurt or, or mentally or whatever, whatever might be something that makes you where you can't work, then we have the responsibility to help you. But if you won't work, if you just won't work, then you need starved death. That's, exactly, that's what he says. He said, if a man won't work, neither shall he eat. And so we need to quit bailing people out that are being disobedient to God and let them suffer the consequences of their actions. As a matter of fact, you say, where did that come from? You're so mean. Well, I'm, you know, it might appear that I am mean, but I'm just trying to be scriptural about things. Uh, look at Luke 16 if you want to see the perfect example, the, the, the prodigal son. That we, you know, the dad and two sons, and one says, Give me everything, and he got it, and he left, and he went, and he spent all of his dad's resources and all of his money. Then, when he got through spending everything, the devil said, Go feed pigs, because that's the only job you're worthy for. And he went down there and he started feeding the pigs, and he got so hungry that he wanted to eat what he saw the pig, the slop started looking good to him. And the very next line said, And no man gave him anything. And the very next line says, and he came to himself. That just means if somebody had given him something, a pack of navs or, a, you know, an a, a RC cola or something, I mean, if somebody had gone down there and bailed him out, he probably never would have come to himself. So quit financing other people's rebellion against God. If they want to rebel against God, let them suffer the consequences of it. It's their choice. You can rebel against God if you want to. You can get out here and not work if you don't want to. But don't expect me to pay for your rebellion against God. Yeah, Bree. So how do you come about then when you see uh, homeless people putting their money on the I don't give them anything. And the only reason I say that is because to be responsible spiritually. Now, the Bible teaches us, and by the way, let me just say this to you, that all of the scripture in the New Testament that talks about giving money is related to helping poor people and widows. All of them. If you find a scripture in the New Testament that is instructing you to be compassionate and to give and to help poor people, it's always people that are poor and people that are widows. Now, it means the working poor or poor because they can't work not poor because they stink and won't work or they got a pro, an addiction where they won't obey the rules and they're out there begging on the street because 
they don't want to obey the rules that say you can't smoke marijuana and stay here or you can't pop, you know, Oxycontin and live here. And so, uh, yeah, you, pay, you know, right. I mean, and here's the thing. When you see somebody standing on a street corner, and I'm not, look, I'm not talking about, I'm not trying to say you don't need to be compassionate with needy people. I'm just saying it's your responsibility to know why they're needy. Now, if I got somebody who's in my church or a member of this church, and I see them, and about half the time they work every day, but they can't afford gas to come to church, then that is a legitimate person in need, and I, and, and I can be compassionate toward that, and I can help with that. Or we've got a widow who's just lost a husband, and they got a bunch of kids, and, the, you know, I, and well, I can be compassionate to that. But somebody standing on the side of the road that says, uh, we'll work for food, who is that? I don't know who that is. That's probably somebody that lives up here in one of these nice houses out here and they put on their nasty tennis shoes and old raggedy stuff and, and got a sign held up and they make money doing that every day. You've watched reports. You've watched John Stossel and all that. John Stossel said he made two or $300 a day with a bucket sitting down, laying there, acting like he's asleep on the sidewalk in one of these cities and people just come by and put money in the bucket. He was not, he was not disabled. He was, not, he was just a, a con artist. And I'm just saying that if I don't know, then I don't need to give because I'm not responsible. And I guarantee you, if you want to see if it's true, all you have to do is raise your window down and say, hey, I got some leaves that need to be raked. Come on, get in, and I'll buy you a hamburger when you get through and see what they say to you. I guarantee you they ain't coming with you because they will not work for anything, much less work for food. They don't want any food. I know it, haven't you? No, they won't, they won't, they won't leave their spot. You know why? Because they're a con man making money off of sympathetic people. So there you go. Don't waste your money. I'm, I'm just saying, look, you, you are responsible for where you plant your seed. You, we were talking about planting seeds a while ago, investing in your future. Look. If you plant your seed in a field that's going to eat your seed, you're not going to get any return on it. And whose responsibility is to make sure I'm putting it in a good field rather than a field that's just going to eat my seed? Somebody sprayed Roundup and ain't nothing coming in there. I'm responsible. I'm responsible to know who I'm giving and where it's going and what's happening because if I'm helping to finance somebody's rebellion against God, I might have a little responsibility in that. In other words, I say, I want this person to come to the Lord. I want this person to come to themselves. I want them to see what they are, what they need, and make a, an adjustment to, to, to have a better life. But I'm giving them 5 or $10 when I pass by, and other people are doing it, and they're getting three or $400 a day to stay a junkie or an addict or a bum or something like that. They're never going to come to themselves. Nobody could ever te reason with them about, okay, life's not right. What do you think's wrong? What do you think we need to do about this? Do you need to change something in your life? No, because I'm making, I'm getting rich off of this. And, and you can't tell them anything. But if, if, you, if that money dries up and now they really are starving laying there on the side of the road, you can say, what do you think needs to change about your life? I don't know, but something's got to change. Well, let me ask you to consider this. And then you might have some influence into their life. And they might change. But right now, mm, -mm. So anyway, uh, we need to be responsible for the seed we plant the field we plant in, that it is going to be a good field and it's going to have a good crop. And it. Right, and you work it. The field, the That's right. So does that answer your question? Okay. I just, you know, I just have that. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to um, say the, no, let me just go on. I think I can get it. I think y'all, y'all got the law of work, right? Right? Okay. I mean, I could go on and say just one other thing about it. Uh, let me just say this one other thing so I can really get in trouble. Um, when you're trying to, discern, to decide, I know lots of families have husbands and wives that work, lots of families. And ours was one for many, many years, many years. So I'm not saying, I'm not being negative about working families. 
I'm not being negative about husbands and wives at work. Thank the Lord if both of you can work and have good skills and you can help because we live in a world nowadays that almost demands two salaries. I don't know. Seriously, I don't know how, I don't know how some people make it or are going to make it because they don't really seem to have a lot of skills that people will pay a lot of money for. Uh, and, and both of them can be working and not make enough to make it, you know? I mean, seriously. So I, I feel that, and I feel for that. But let me just say this. If you're, if you're a family and you're trying to make a decision about, okay, should, should my wife go to, go to work? Or, you know, and y'all are trying to decide, okay, is this it? Uh, one thing you need to, there's a couple of things you need to consider about this. Uh, number one, do you have children at home? Uh, because it's your responsibility to, ra to rear your children. And a lot of times the, the debt level or the need level of the family is because you're spending way more than you're bringing in and you're giving, because you're giving the children a lot of stuff. And you think that's great. I'm, and I'm going to tell you as a testimony from a child, who didn't have anything. I'm from a very poor family. Um, and we didn't have a lot of stuff. I pushed pine cones in a little bit of sand to pretend it was an automobile when I was growing up, and I'd make little frog houses with the sand and pat it down on your foot or something. And, take it. and, and we played like that and used a stick for a horse. Or I mean, you know, we just didn't have stuff. I didn't, first video game I saw was Pong, uh, when I was a teenager, uh, the first Atari, which is way, way down, I saw I was probably 23 or 24 years old. I didn't know that in The Wizard of Oz that Oz was color. When Dorothy got to Oz, it turned color because I never saw a color TV until I got to be an older teenager. I mean, you know, I'm just trying to testify to the fact that, that from whence I'm about to speak, I, I came from. But And here's, here's what I want to say to you. My family didn't have anything, but I can't tell you right now, I can't remember a single toy that I had when I was a child. I can't really remember a toy. I know I had some, but I can't really remember, okay, that was really a special toy, and I really, but I can remember this. I can remember my dad going down and shooting basketball with me behind the house. I remember Daddy getting out in the yard and pitching baseball and teaching me how to pitch and catch and all that kind of stuff. I remember Mama riding us around in the car, taking us to nice neighborhoods to show us if we really applied ourselves that we could live in a place like that. That could be our future if, if we really wanted it and we would sacrifice to have it. I can remember getting out on the driveway and my Daddy created a game that you pitched washers at a board that had numbers and you added up to 21 and you could win the game. I mean, I do remember all that. Way more. Had fun as a child. Have great memories of that. All of that. And what was that? Involved? That was my parents being involved in my life. What I'm just saying to you is you need to measure stuff like this. You need to say, okay, is having more stuff worth not having the time to have that kind of relationship with your kids? I mean, being a sh two ships passing in the night because you, you got to have all this stuff. No, your kids don't need more stuff. They need you more. And if, you, if, you, if both of you are gone all the time and work, work or not, I mean, if you need to work, okay. If you got to pay for the house and the basic necessities of life and you have, great. But you need to consider that. And you need to consider other things like how much is childcare going to cost? How much more makeup are you going to use? Are you going to need a second automobile? How much gas does that use? How, what kind of new clothes are you going to have to have? Because you can't go to work every day looking sloppy like a pig. So it's going, you're going to have new dresses, new outfits, new that. You're going to have to have more makeup because you're going to have to doll up every day. You're going to have gas money. You're going to have more insurance on the car. You're going to have to have, maybe have a new automobile because you don't want her to drive junk around because she needs to get to work every day. You're going, I mean, child care is going to cost you $60 a week for the baby to go to daycare. They're always going to be sick because something's going around daycare. You're going to be in the emergency room in a doctor's office more than you're at work. Are they going to let you go from work? Can you get out? I mean, all of this is consideration for whether it's feasible 
for both of you to have to work all the time. And so I'm just saying, think about these things. Pray about these things. This is, this is, what, this is what excellent people do. This is what spiritual people do. This is what people that make it do. This is the kind of considerations that you have in order to have a life that you're praying for, that you're asking God to, to, to work in you. Part of God's answer to you may be tonight saying, gosh, boy, I never thought about that. When God's saying, well, you asked me for a good life, and here it is. I'm telling you how to have one. Here it is right here. So anyway, the ninth law is the law of ethics, and the law of ethics, and I'm just going to hit it, and we'll, we'll move on. Um, ethics are your guiding <laughs> principles. Ethics say, this is the kind of person I am. And I'm going to live this kind of life. And I put two pledges in your notes. And those two pledges are about honesty and about investments. And basically, the pledge of honesty is saying, I'm going to tell the truth even if I lose a sale, even if it, if it lessens the value of my product. Um, I'm going to pay my bills on time and in, or in advance. If I can't pay my bill, I'm not going to run from the bill collectors. I'm going to call the person that I owe the money to and tell them I'm going to be late. I'm sorry. I, I, I am going to pay my bill, and I want you to know that in advance so that you'll know that I'm not planning to skip out, and I do have a plan, and here's my plan, and, and if you'll be patient with me, I'll, I'll get it to you. I'm going to pay my bills. Don't make them chase you down, run you down, turn you over to a bill collector, not answer the phone, all that kind of stuff. I mean, that, that's the kind of pledge that is. And then the pledge for investments is I'm not going to spend money without my spouse knowing about it. I'm not going to spend money that puts my, my family in jeopardy for not having. I mean, in other words, I'm not investing the, the house note on some lottery ticket somewhere or something, I'm, and, and I'm not going to spend money that, that my mate doesn't know about, and we're going to make decisions together about what needs to be done and, and all those kind of stuff. And uh, I'm going to seek wise counsel if I'm thinking about making an investment that's going to take a lot of my resources and stuff. That, that's, those are just ethics. Those are the, uh, the values of my life. The values that I live by are my ethics. I don't steal from my employers. That includes time. I show up on time. I work the whole time. I take the right time for lunch hour. I don't take long coffee breaks. Uh, I do what I'm supposed to do. An honest day's work for an honest day's pay. I mean, you know, these are ethics in life. And this is the like a creed, a, 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 a pledge that you live by. So, Law number nine is I need to have ethics. I need to develop an ethical standard and say this is what my life is about financially. Number 10, and finally, is the law of the cross. The law of the cross basically says I take my finances to the cross. I, my whole financial life is run through the cross because everything belongs to God, not just a tenth, not just a seed, but everything belongs to God. Like I was talking about that rich young ruler. Rich young ruler, Jesus said, he said, how can I have eternal life? And Jesus said, go sell everything you have, give the money to the poor, and then, then come and follow me, and you'll inherit eternal life. And I know people that when they hear that little thought, they say, man, that's drastic. Well, so was the cross. The cross was a place of death. The cross is where Jesus laid everything down for us his whole life, his whole resources, and his whole everything. And so everything in my life, the, the cross is the place of total loss. Jesus lost everything on the cross, his life, his influence, his value. They nailed above him mockery and statements of accusation above Jesus on the cross. They tuck, stuck a spear in his side. They spat on him. They mocked him. They ridiculed him on the cross. Jesus gave up his reputation, gave up his life, gave up his influence, gave up his everything about himself on the cross. And the law of the cross just says, it's my responsibility to the kingdom of God that everything I have gets run through the cross. And, and only those things uh, that filter through the cross 
am I to live my financial life with because everything belongs to God. It's not money that's evil. It's not possessions that are evil. It's the love of money that's evil. And the love of possessions is evil. So my love for this world stuff goes to the cross and dies on the cross. And my responsibility to the kingdom of God is what comes off of that cross and lives in my life that, that the resurrected Christ honors and respects in my life. That's the place I go to die. That's where all of my stuff, that's where every little thing my beady eyes see at Walmart goes to die right there on the cross. That's where all of my gluttony and all of my greed and all of my self-centeredness and selfishness that's where it goes to die, at the cross. And I place myself at the cross every day in order for God to filter into my life the things that financially I need to be responsible to. And I need to hear the Holy Spirit. And I don't need to invest in things that the Holy Spirit's not leading me to. And I need to be responsible financially. And I need to be ethical. And I need to plant my seed in good field. And I, you know, all of those, all of these 10, all these 10 commandments of your money come through the cross. That's the place where it comes first. All right. Is that, is that, y'all got all that? Y'all got all that? Everybody got all that? <laughs> I'll probably get hate mail about some of it, but that's all right. Um, uh, anyway, <laughs> just trying to help. Okay. That's <laughs> all it boils down to. All right. Next week. Now, let me tell you that I plan to finish up all, we, we have two more uh, 10 commandments. We have our marriage, which are our relationships, and we'll start them next Sunday night. And we're, and we're probably going to spend two weeks on them because they are really very important. I don't want to rush through them. And then the last one, the law of my ministry, which is basically the laws of, uh, of how I do my life as a Christian, how, what I'm responsible for and how I look at life as a Christian and my responsibility to people around me and in my family and all that. That's my ministry. Uh, I might do that in one week because I want to be finished before Thanksgiving. So November starts next week. There are four weeks in November. The last Sunday in November is the Sunday before Thanksgiving. So I'd like to be finished within these four weeks because we've got about four more lessons so I'll give you some idea, and then we'll start another class in January after, because everybody gets up all been Once Thanksgiving hits, man, life is just with Christmas and New Year's and all that. Okay. All right. Y'all got any questions or observations or requests for prayer? <laughs> Whatever. All right.